I've heard it said that women are better at multitasking than men. Do you think that's true? Uh, if I look at my household, I would have to say it probably is, at least when it comes to certain type of tasks. My wife does much better at multitasking than I do, especially when it comes to family stuff, right? Well, the Bible tells us that it can be very dangerous to be a multitasker in spiritual things. That when we have our attention divided and our loyalty is divided, it leads to focusing on one thing or the other. And let's face it, in everyday multitasking, you have to admit it's probably exactly the same. The call of Scripture is not that we multitask trying to play both sides or both, both kingdoms, the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of heaven, but rather that we exclusively devote ourselves single-mindedly to the kingdom of heaven and then live in this world down here as a member of that kingdom. So we're not Jekyll and Hyde. We're not multiple personalities. We're not divided in our spiritual focus. We are all focused towards heaven. We are entirely consumed by the vision of heaven and spiritual things and then bringing that spiritual reality that spiritual experience that transformation of heart and soul the becoming of a new creature into the experience of this world that we might be quite different to this world though we live in this world the parable that I think highlights this especially we find in Luke chapter 16 in Luke 16 we read the story of an unrighteous steward it starts like this now, Jesus was also saying to the disciples, there was a certain rich man who had a steward, and the steward was reported to him as squandering his possessions. Now, a steward is essentially a manager, right? A business manager, you might say. Maybe even an accountant. Whatever he is, he has the, he has the financial oversight, maybe even power of attorney. He has the right to write out the check, to sign the check, to, to cash the check, to spend the money in behalf of the master. The master has given him a mandate. I want you to manage my affairs in such a way that it is just, it is righteous, and it serves those around you. But as it goes, others were not happy with what they saw happening. They realized this man was using his position for his own selfish gain. And so what they did was they reported to the owner of all the goods. They reported that your steward, your financial manager, your business manager is misusing his position, misusing his power and misusing your wealth. Well, what happens next, of course, is that the, the owner of the goods calls the steward in and says to him, mate, listen, you haven't been doing what's right here. I'm going to be removing you from your position. I want you to settle accounts. I want you to get the books up to date, and then we're going to relieve you of your duties. So he's putting him on final notice. He's given him his, his final notice of termination. And so it's at that point that the steward decides he needs to get clever. So it says here, and we're reading here from verse 4. I know what I shall do, so that when I am removed from the stewardship, they will receive me into their homes. All those people that he has accounts, you know, dealings with in terms of the accounts and, and business dealings in behalf of the master. I know what I'll do so that they'll be friendly to me when I leave my position, when I've lost my job. I, I, I don't want to go begging. I'm too, much, uh, I'm too much of a refined man for digging and manual labor. That's actually what it says here in verse 3. So I need to win over these people. He decides that his strategy is to show them favor, to do them favors with the accounts of the master before he's removed from his position so that those people will be indebted to him and they will take him and support him when he loses his role, loses his position. He summoned each one of his master's debtors and he began saying to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, A hundred measures of oil. He said to him, Take your bills, sit down quickly, write fifty. Then he said to another, And how much do you owe? And he said, A hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. His master praised the unrighteous steward because he had acted shrewdly. For the sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their, their own kind than the sons of light. You see, Jesus here... <laughs> He tells the story, and it may even, who knows, it may even have been an actual happening. I mean, that's the kind of thing that happens in our world today too, right? People often use their position for financial fraud, for selfish gain. They need to be relieved of their position. But before he does, he gives all these discounts to all these people, right? So that he, he buys their friendship. They think he's a great guy so that they will show compassion and kindness. It's a case of, hey, you owe me, mate, because remember that thing I did for you? Well, how about you help me out now? He wants to call in the chip, right? He wants to 
he wants to call in the favor. He wants to make sure that he's in good standing so that he's taken care of afterwards. And the man here in the parable, the owner of all the goods, I don't know if he regretted it and went, wow, I should have actually just taken it off him right away. But he kind of looks at this and there's this admiration for, you know, you might have mismanaged my goods, but you're a very clever, intelligent, um, cunning man. And he praises him for his cleverness. If only that cleverness, if only that shrewdness had been devoted to the original purpose, the original intent of rightly managing the goods of the master, this event would not be unfolding. He obviously has capability. He obviously has insight. He obviously has intention and, or, or intelligence. But instead of devoting it to an unselfish purpose, his biggest crime... The biggest crime in this parable is not fundamentally the discounts that he offers out, because after all, the, the man praises him for that, right? The reason his stewardship is taken away from him, his managerial position is taken away from him, is because of the selfishness of his heart in the use of the master's goods to benefit himself instead of the true purpose that they were entrusted to him for, which was to benefit the community, to benefit those around about. So the real crime here, we mustn't get hung up on the discounts that are given. The real crime here is the selfishness of heart. This man had to decide whether he was going to serve himself or whether he was going to serve his master. And both before his stewardship is taken away, as well as after the announcement that his stewardship would be taken away, he decides that he will serve his own interests. So he misused the goods of the master, which leads to his dismissal. That was selfish intent, selfish ambition. He then carries that over, and he's not giving discounts to others for their blessing, but because he has an end game in mind, which is that he will then be taken, uh, taken care of by being able to call in favors. You know that you can do nice things for other people for ulterior motives? You know that you can do good things for people that would look at you and say, wow, that's a real Christian thing to do. That's a real gracious thing to do. That's a real kind thing to do. What a philanthropic heart. What a, what a charitable person you are. We can do things that look that way to others, but we can do them with the wrong intent or with a selfish motive. In the eyes of heaven, good deeds done for selfish purposes are not good deeds, they are evil deeds. In fact, they're probably even more evil than evil deeds are because, because of the deceptive nature. I mean, think about this. Could Satan do kind things if it meant that he would draw you into a trap of deception? I don't think Satan has an embargo against doing things that look kind or that feel kind. So why would his agents have an embargo on doing things that look kind or feel kind. Ultimately, though, their agenda is to secure their own position, their own favor, their own security. So keep that in mind as we keep going here. The issue in this parable is about the selfishness of heart. It's the, it's the way in which we do these good things with ulterior motives for our own purposes. Now, there is a historical meaning to this parable, and it's very simply this. Jesus is talking to the Jewish people again, to the Israelite nation. They had been entrusted to be his stewards. All the spiritual blessings had been given to them. The oracles of God, the revelations, the written word of God, the, the prophetic insights, the knowledge of the plan of salvation. All these things had been given to them, even down to the rites and the rituals and the celebrations and the all, all things religious, all things spiritual, all things uh, of a symbolic nature had been given to the Jews, not for their own benefit merely, not to make them separate, distinct and superior to others, but that they might be a blessing, that they might be a channel of gifting to the world. God's greatest honor to the Israelite nation was not even the gifts he gave them, but the joy that they would find in becoming a co-worker with him, sharing his, his heart of selflessness, of disinterested uh, service towards those around them. So he gives them the gifts. 
the possessions with which to trade, right? In the language of the parable. He gives them these, these spiritual blessings that they might have that which they need to bring life and healing and hope to the darkness of the nations around them, to introduce them to the Savior. And then the Israelite nation would share in the wealth or share in the joy, if you like, the spiritual wealth and the spiritual joy in seeing a, the world around them transformed. First, they get the gifts themselves, but what they missed was the greater gift would have been participating with Christ and experiencing the glorious results of giving away those gifts. So instead, what did they do? They became proud. They became prejudiced. They became separatist. They became exclusivist. They became all things that made them superior to all others. And they used their position of spiritual wealth, their position of religious power, their, 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 their spiritual knowledge. They used all of their rituals, their rites, and their ceremonies not to extend grace to the world around them, but to differentiate themselves from the world around them. They used religion as a barrier instead of religion being a gift to be shared as it points to relationship with God and the reality of salvation. And the point here that Jesus makes is that at the end of all of this, the man still loses his stewardship. He has this strange line in here where he says, For the sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of light. You know what I think Jesus is saying there? That when it comes to secular things, when it comes to things having not to do with religion, but to doing with business and this world, we often act with more intelligence, with more energy, with more effort, with more zeal than when it comes to spiritual things of eternal lasting value. That sometimes we are more diligent businessmen because we're serving ourselves for the sake of selfish gain than we are stewards of gospel mysteries because we kind of are just not that motivated when it comes to blessing others. Is it possible that we put much thought, much energy, much, much effort, much work into the things of this world? We strategize, we plan carefully and meticulously, but when it comes to the work of the kingdom, when it comes to spiritual realities, when it comes to sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, we're kind of lackadaisical, tomorrow's another day, we don't strategize, we don't put our best foot forward, we just kind of do it as it comes along, we just, we just muck around a little bit. Well, if we were doing that kind of thing in our business place, would we still be employed? Would we still, would we still be the employee of the month? Maybe not so much. And I think that this is the point of the parable here. How would we invest greater zeal, effort, organization, strategy, and all of that in earthly things to serve ourselves while we are not paying attention either to our own salvation or to the salvation of those around us? This is the painful question that is asked here subtly in this parable. Jesus says here in verse 9, I say to you, make friends for yourselves by means of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when it fails, they may receive you into eternal dwellings. Because if all you are doing is serving yourself, whether in carnal spirit, uh, whether in whether in temporal things or whether in spiritual things, if all you're doing is serving yourself, then the only reward you will ever have is down here. So what we are called to, what Jesus tells us, you know, aim a little higher, look heavenward, because he's saying to us. Be careful of trying to multitask. You cannot serve two masters. In fact, that's exactly where he ends here in verse 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon's a fancy word for, for earthly things, worldly things, wealth, or if we were to just translate that even more generally and yet more specifically, you cannot serve God and yourself. You cannot live for you and for the kingdom of God. It is one or the other. Because to try and hold on to both masters is certainly to lose the benefit of both worlds. Have you thought about that? You can't be fully in this world because you're kind of bound by the morals and the restrictions of the kingdom of God. Yet you're not fully invested in the kingdom of God, not living the fullest of the joy, the fullest of fellowship with God because you're distracted by this world. Choose one world is what Jesus says. Choose one. Obviously, Jesus wants us to choose the heavenly kingdom. He desires our single-mindedness and our focus to be exclusively on the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, obviously. But he's saying to us, choose one. 
That, by the way, is the same message that comes to us in Revelation chapter 3. You have seven churches throughout Revelation. And when you get down to the, the end of that story, the seventh church is called the church of Laodicea. And the message of warning that comes to that church is you are lukewarm. And because you are lukewarm, you know, speaking about water, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. You, you should be either hot or you should be cold. Either live for the kingdom of God or live for the kingdoms of this world. But do not think that by being, you know, by being trying to be clever, by trying to be a shrewd, cunning steward, you can have one foot in this world, one foot in that world, and you can get by into the eternal kingdom by having the best of both worlds. God says, I'm looking for people to be in or out, preferably in, but the worst thing is half in. You know why? Because not only are you still going to suffer eternal loss, but it is a poor representation to the world around. It sets a bad example and it misrepresents the character of God, the kingdom of heaven. It is, instead of being evangelistic, it's mis-evangelistic, right? It's, 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 it's an aberration of the kingdom of God. People are drawn to Christ. This is what he said. He said, and I, when I am lifted up, will draw all men to myself. But when you only lift Jesus up a little way, People are not interested in that. They are not drawn to a half lift to Jesus. He needs to be all. He needs to be everything to us. This parable of the shrewd steward, it's really about commitment, isn't it? It's really about the call to faithful service, to unselfish labor. And there's another passage in the Bible that I think, that I think hints at this as well, more than hints at it. We find it in Isaiah chapter 58. And it's a passage that was in the Old Testament, spoken by the prophet Isaiah, written by the prophet Isaiah, to the people of Israel hundreds of years before Jesus comes on the scene of action to tell them the, the parable of the shrewd steward, right? Now remember, the parable of the shrewd steward is aimed directly at them, by extension to all of us who claim to be a part of the kingdom of God. Now listen to this. Listen to what Isaiah says about religion, about the practice of spiritual things in the time of in which the prophet is living hundreds of years before Christ. God says to them through the prophet Isaiah, verse 6 of Isaiah 58, Is this not the fast which I choose, to loosen the bonds of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke, and to let the oppressed go free and break every yoke? Is it not to divide your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into the house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh or from difficult relatives? You got one of those. We've got one of those, right? Do we, do we sometimes avoid people, even our own flesh and blood, because they annoy us, because they, we feel like they, they're an inconvenience to us or they're not deserving of us? You know, what is genuine religion? What is true spirituality? What is it to be a part of the kingdom of God? It's not the rituals. It's not the external behaviors. It's not a mere external keeping of God's law. It's not merely the round of church and ceremony or synagogue or whatever else it is that we go to. It's not the, it's not the family worships in the mornings and the evenings or the personal devotions per se. All of those things have their place, but that is not where it ends. That isn't genuine change of heart. You can do all of those things, those good things for wrong reasons, as we spoke about earlier on, because you think you're going to merit favor with God, because he's going to look down and go, yep, 10 out of 10, gold star, you get to come to heaven. None of those things merit favor with God, and none of those things in and of themselves mean that you are a true follower of God. Listen to what Jesus says. He says, you know what I'm looking for? I'm looking for a religious experience that may involve all of those things we just mentioned, but where you do not hide your heart from me, where your heart is surrendered to me, where we enter into fellowship with one another, and my influence over you, my Holy Spirit implanted within you, changes your heart so that every day the people you meet, the relationships you engage with, sense, feel, and experience the kingdom of God coming to you. You see, this idea of, of letting the oppressed go free, this idea of breaking the yokes, this idea of sharing your bread with the hungry or, or giving home to the poor uh, or to, to clothe the naked or to, or to being available to those difficult relatives of ours, our own flesh and blood. This is genuine. This is genuine religion. This is true spirituality. When you come into contact with God, when you genuinely have the effect upon your heart is regeneration. It is recreation. It is the filling of love that flows outward to others. Your relationships with others 
are the test of your spirituality. That is the litmus test. The way you treat those who need your help. The way you reach out or don't reach out to those who are in trouble. Even your own flesh and blood. You know, I once heard someone say that you can gauge the quality of your spiritual experience by considering the most difficult relationship in your circle of friendship and family. Think about that. We often pride ourselves on those moments of victory or on those moments where, where things are going well between people. But what about when conflict arises? What about when you're defrauded and cheated and it calls for forgiveness? What about when you're angered? What about when forgiveness is called for? I mean, do you hear what I'm saying? Really, the real test of our Christian experience isn't the high moments of the great relationships we have. It's really, it's really... What, how things go in the most difficult of our relationships. Do we show the grace of Christ? Are we forgiving like Jesus is? Are we wise? Do we counsel with the words of heaven and with the heart of Christ? Are we moved with compassion for those especially who we feel like don't really deserve it? These are the big questions that Isaiah asks. This is the idea of the parable of the shrewd steward that Jesus tells. Who are we living for in this world? Me, myself, and I, or Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When you come down here to verse 10, it tells us in Isaiah 58, If you give yourself to the hungry, satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then your light will rise in darkness and your gloom will become like midday. The Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your desire uh, in scorched places and give strength to your bones, and you will be like a watered garden. See, you and I are called to live in the presence of the grace of God, that we may spend the grace of God, manage the resources of heaven, the attributes, the character attributes, the fruits of the Spirit that God bestows upon you. These are the things He gives us to trade with in the world, to serve the world around us. The blessings He gives us in the material world are a spiritual gift entrusted to us to alleviate the suffering of others. Hey, have you ever heard this argument? If there's really a good God in the universe, if there's really a benevolent, kind, heavenly Father, then why is there so much brokenness in the world? Why are all of these things happening and there's no relief? You know, we, we, we point to God and we ask the big question about why does God allow it? Why does God, why if He's good, does He tolerate it at best, uh, even, even make it happen at worst? You know what I think the parable of the good steward in a subtle way, although it's not really about that big question, it does answer the big question because it tells us that God has given us the resources of this world, temporal resources and spiritual resources through regeneration through Christ. He has given us the resources and we are His stewards. In the Old Testament, Israel was His steward. In the New Testament, the Church of Christ, you know, the, the, the family of God on earth is His stewards. Any believer who names the name of Jesus is His steward of whatever God has bestowed upon them. Everything you have is His. Did you get that? Nothing that we have, have we gotten by our own strength. I mean, think about it. Who gives you life every day? Breath in your lungs, a beating heart. Who gives you a mind to think of things? Who prompts your thoughts? Who has led you in the paths of education, given you skill and training? Who is it that gives you a renewed strength every morning? Who is it that connects you through providential leading with relationships and with people that you can work with? I mean, think about it. What do we have in this world that isn't His? And when we finally come to receive Him as Savior, as Lord, and as God, that's the place where we should be, all of a sudden our eyes should be opened and we realize, Everything I have is a gift, not just spiritual things, not just the graces of forgiveness and the kindness of God, but even my earthly blessings all are a result of the kindness of God in my life. Some have greater evidences of that, some have smaller evidences, but whatever you have, whatever your strengths, whatever your unique position, it is a gift from God. And the big thing that changes in our hearts when we come into this experience, this relationship, this journey with God, we realize that we are His by creation, as is this entire world. We realize that we are His by redemption. He has purchased us back from certain death. So again, it emphasizes this fact that everything we have, everything we are, everything bestowed upon us is the loving grace of God. And if it's not ours, 
then we are not free to spend it on our own pleasure. It stands to reason that He gives us these gifts that we might manifest His character of selflessness in the way we use them for those around us. As He gives freely to us, we ought to give freely to others. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to take care of your earthly needs, to make sure you've got a roof over your head and food on the table, not in the least, because He blesses you in this way too. But there is often excess in His gifts that He gives to us. And with that excess, He calls us to share, to give, to serve. So let me come back to this big question, right? What about the, the inequity in this world? What about the injustice in this world? What about this good God that sits on a throne and yet all of this happens down here and we put the blame at His door? Well, what if the story of the shrewd steward is actually revealing to us that everything in this world, though it belongs to God, is in the hands of His stewards, you, me, and the rest of the human family. And if we choose to use it selfishly, if we choose to mismanage it, if we choose to put it upon the altar of selfishness instead of upon the altar of offering toward God, then that very act, the logical outworking, the consequences of that selfishness is precisely that some will go without while others have an excess and an abundance. It's not because God is not good. It's because His stewards, humanity, created in His image, have chosen instead of the benevolent character of selflessness, selflessness and love, instead of using, exercising that character in the use of the blessings He bestows upon us, instead we hoard, we gather together. And you think to yourself, well, I don't have a lot of wealth anyway. It's not about the amount that we hoard. It's about the spirit of selfishness that causes the hoarding. You know, the person who only has a little bit but is tight-fisted with it is in the eyes of heaven much the same as the statesman of a great nation that, that, that embezzles the wealth of the taxes of the people and they go hungry and they starve in the streets and they riot while he has multiple properties across the world and has offshore bank accounts and has made sure of his earthly financial success at the expense of others. We look at that and we say that's disgusting, that's repulsive. But we often demonstrate the same spirit with the meager blessings that we have. We are one and the same in our selfishness. And it is because of human selfishness, because of human mismanagement, that we have this inequity in this world, this suffering in this world, this, this inability to meet the, huge, the, the, the needs of humanity that, that, that are in want. What if the real answer to the inequity and the brokenness of this world, we already have it. The blessings of God, used wisely with a character of selflessness, would heal this world. Think about that. That's why when we jump over to 1 Timothy, 1, 1 Timothy chapter 6, reading from verse 17, the Apostle Paul says this to the church, Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and be ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. You know what the Apostle Paul is saying here? Translate the riches of earth into the riches of heaven. And the way you do that is when you serve others with that riches, bringing them the gospel message, alleviating physical suffering and want. When you are the heart, the hands, the compassion of Jesus, using the bestowal of earthly riches or your talents or your abilities or whatever it is, the, the influence you have to, to shift the tide of the world for the alleviation and the healing of the world, then you are acting the part of a good steward instead of the part of a bad steward where we are serving ourselves instead of God. You know, when you read in the book of Malachi, Malachi chapter 3, which is, of course, the last book in the Old Testament, and when you read there in the book of Malachi, it gives us the minimum, what I call the minimum test of our loyalty to God. And it says the following. So Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. 
Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Now, I want to be sure we understand this. We don't give to God to receive from God because that's simply a business transaction. Instead, the idea of tithes and offerings are our minimum test of loyalty manifested in a financial sense, recognizing that God is the majority shareholder in our life. Like I said earlier, that everything we have is from Him. Yes, we may have put our energy and our time into it, but we only got that energy and that time from Him in the first place. We are co-workers with Him, but when God is the majority shareholder in our lives, when we realize that this is the case, he calls upon us to employ the blessings the way He would employ the blessings. Alleviate the sufferings of humanity. Bring the tithes and the offerings into the storehouse. What is that all about? Well, God said to Israel, He said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to fund the kingdom of heaven in this world. You know how you become a funder of the kingdom of heaven in this world? You return the tithes and the offerings to the storehouse, to the church of God. And as you do that, that enables the proclamation of the message. That enables those who go out there with, with other unique talents and, and skill sets, such as the preaching and the teaching of the word. They devote themselves to that and they're supported by that fundraising mechanism called tithes and offerings to bless the world with the message of Jesus. And that message of Jesus, let me just remind you, is the only ultimate cure for the problems of this world. It is a good thing to alleviate suffering. It is a good thing to spend money on charities that, that, that bring food to the hungry. It's a good thing to clothe the naked. It is a good, good thing to do all of those things, but we are only treating symptoms when we do that. The real curse of humanity, the thing that the, the, the parable of the shrewd steward highlights for us, the real curse the cause of those symptoms is the selfishness of the human heart. And until we dethrone the selfishness of the human heart, these symptoms will prevail and we are simply putting band-aids on, on the problems of this world. And how do you dethrone self? There is no self-help book for that. There is only the hope we have in Jesus Christ. So when you invest in the kingdom of God, when you share, when you, when you fund the gospel work, you know what you're doing? You are funding a cure to the malady of this world at its heart root. You are investing in fighting against the selfishness of the world by inviting, by enabling the gospel to go forth and the message of Jesus, the relationship with Jesus, to become the reality that transforms other hearts and lives and causes yet another one to forsake selfishness and live selflessly. Yet another one to forsake selfishness and live selflessly. And yet another one, and another one, and another one. And as we do that, we will find that our experience in this world is transformed. Now, I'm not suggesting to you that we are headed towards a utopian world down here. I think our only hope is the coming kingdom of God at the return of Jesus. But what I am saying is that every soul that is touched, truly trust, touched by the grace of God, is a soul that's not only saved for eternity, but is a soul that sweetens the influences that exist in this world becomes another person in the chain of transmission for the kingdom of God. And at the end of the day, what greater thing is there to be a part of than investing in the future kingdom of God? So instead of being a cunning, shrewd steward of selfish service, I invite you to step into a whole world of adventure by becoming a wise steward of selfless service as we recognize the gifts that God has given to us, time, talents, abilities, health, wealth, all of these things are spiritual blessings bestowed from God to improve the experience of life down here, to invest in the kingdom of God for time and for eternity. We manifest the true loyalty of our heart in the way we manage the gifts that God has given us in this world for the blessing of others. And in that manifestation of our character is revealed whether we are truly citizens of the heavenly kingdom or merely time-serving servants of our own self and our own idolatry of heart. Let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, I pray for the person hearing this. I pray for myself right now, Lord. 
that you would empty us of this plague of selfishness, that you would make us kind, generous, uh, open-handed towards others, even as you have been all these things and more towards us. So we ask, Lord, that you would change the very direction of this world, and we ask, Lord, that your kingdom would come soon, and that we would be found to be heartfelt citizens of that kingdom in that day. In Jesus' name, amen.